self-conscious about the size of my nose. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, I am Virginia, and you guys are looking really good from up here. And um, today I'm gonna talk about, from, uh, about going from startup entrepreneur and my journey to what I'm trying to do right now, which is become an online entrepreneur. Clicker, on stage, on stage, on the table. Isn't it there? Hey there. Hey there. <laughs> no. Maybe it's missing something. Yeah, it's working. But um, while I start then, um, before I tell you my journey, let me know also who's in the audience. Can I see a show of hands? Those that are already digital nomads? Great. Those that are entrepreneurs, so working for somebody else, starting projects for somebody else. Okay, pure. And um, those starting to live a digital nomad life. Great, awesome. Um, so today in my talk, I'm gonna, again, share the story about my entrepreneurial journey and uh, I'm gonna share with you my aha moment when I said, okay, it's time for me to become an entrepreneur. And um, I'm gonna share with you also a formula that I came up with called the Kivkov formula for entrepreneurs uh, to get started. And hopefully by the end, I've inspired some of you uh, to become uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. And my story starts with post-its, like most business plans, great ideas, but um, those post-its were put on my wall when I was 13. I had just read the book, The Secret, and um, I learned that I had to put all my long-term and short-term goals on the wall where I could see them every day. So I spent all night thinking about everything that I wanted to do, putting them on the wall. Next thing I know, my mom's knocking on the door, I'm late for school, and I didn't sleep. I am Virginia Campo, I'm from Colombia, I was raised in Panama, and I'm a humanologist. And what that means is I'm specialized in connecting people to opportunities that are gonna bring them closer to living a fulfilled life. But how am I supposed to do that if I didn't feel my life was being fulfilled? My mom took all those post-its from my wall and put, drew a, tree <laughs> on the wall with a lot of fruits. Those fruits were the goals that I was going to be working on and a lot of leaves. And those leaves were the goals that I was already working on or had already accomplished. If I still had that tree today, it would look like a winter tree. A lot of the leaves had already fallen out, but there was still one fruit hanging there. And it was to be an entrepreneur and start something of my own. Let's start defining what an intrapreneur is. So an intrapreneur is like an in-house entrepreneur, which means it's an, empl an employee that innovates and creates new processes, products, services within a company that they don't own. My entrepreneurial life started very young, like Luke said. Um, I was 18, I had just graduated high school, and I was uh, waiting eight months in Panama to go to the US to study, and I was like, no way, what am I gonna do? So I decided that um, I wanted to work in the UN. And I grew up in a household, like you probably could tell from the story of my mom making the tree, where I was told that everything was possible. So I went, I printed out my CV, at that time, I just said I had volunteered everywhere. And I went to the UN offices in Panama City, which are the regional offices for Latin America. And I said, hi, I want to volunteer with you. And uh, a lot of doors shut down. I was very surprised. But one opened, and it was in the World Food Program, where the HR manager thought I was the cutest thing ever and said, huh, we could use some help. So that's how my career started. I became the youngest uh, employee in the UN. Uh, I was hired after like two weeks of volunteering. And this is also where my entrepreneurial career started. 
A lot of people think that when you work with big organizations, there's no way you can start something within them, especially like the UN. <laughs> but like every single idea usually comes to solve a need, right? So in the UN, I happened to be there at the time of the Haiti earthquake. And I don't know if you guys remember the Haiti earthquake, but it caused a lot of miscommunication. There was a lot of miscommunication between agencies. And where I worked was the department in charge of emergency information. So at the time, my boss, who was a mentor and very incredible, said, we need to do something to coordinate the, the communication better. I said, why don't we create like a update or like an, almost like a newspaper where everybody knows what they're doing. He said, that sounds great. Who wants to consolidate it? I said, me. And uh, I spent the next like three months working till 2 a.m. getting all the information from the different agencies and creating a situation report at 2 a.m. so everybody could have it at their inbox by 8 a.m. and know what was happening. This was, I mean, the UN shaped me as a professional and uh, of course gave me the opportunity to continue to think that anything was possible, that you can start anything within any company. But after two years and a half of working there, I wanted to go see something, some of my impact hands-on. So I met this crazy awesome entrepreneur who told me he was building the world's most sustainable town in the Panamanian jungle. And he said, Virgie, whenever you're ready to see your impact, come work with me. And two years and a half later, I was ready. And I said, hey, Jimmy, I'm ready. I want to see my impact. Next thing I know, I'm moving to this rural town outside of Panama City, 500 people. And I'm starting with him all the community and education programs to include this, like the local community to benefit from what the town that he was about to build. We started creating a very disruptive internship program, bringing interns from the US that would pay to have a hands-on experience in the Panamanian jungle. And um, I did that for a year. We went from zero interns to around 100 interns per semester. And till this day, that internship program continued to grow so much that they were even featured as a documentary on Vice Land called Jungle Town. Then from there, I got the opportunity to go on a leadership program in Prague and learn how to be a leader. And uh, to me, that was like super new. I was like, wow, people can learn how to be a leader and people travel. Uh, Panama is a four million country, like it's very small. <laughs> and everybody knows each other. And unfortunately, sometimes we're exposed to things like this community or like leadership courses. So I was so inspired. I was one of the few Latins. And I said, I want to do these programs in Panama. I want to do it in Latin America so more Latino leaders can attend. The director at the time said, OK, cool. This is usually what we need to figure out in terms of logistics. If you figure it out, we'll start it in Panama. Next, uh, next year, I had everything figured out. I convinced the director, and we were leading two programs a year in Panama on leadership and women leadership. Then I took a super crazy jump again, and um, a little parenthesis, throughout my entrepreneurial life, what I was craving, and I think is one of the lessons, is just learning. I, I just had this craving to become a better person and to learn more and uh, to later on apply it to, I have no idea, but I just want to learn. And um, so I jumped from education and jungle to a bank and probably one of the largest corporate bank. So I went to HSBC, I applied to their trainee program, and I said, I'm ready to learn about banking and why banking are not targeting poor people. And uh, I, this, it, it, this trainee program was incredible because it was like a hands-on MBA, you rotated all over the bank, and they also gave you the most important thing, most valuable thing, 
for me about working in companies, the opportunity to create something. So while I was rotating in retail banking, they were having a lot of problems doing cross-selling of products. And I said, oh, well, maybe we should try to train the people about cross-selling other products that they don't usually sell. I was given the opportunity to create that. And uh, the cross-selling numbers went up quite a bit. And people in HSBC were very, very happy. And I was very happy. I learned a lot. but. It was ready to move. I was ready to move again. So in 2014, I said, OK, it's time for me to leave Panama. I need to have experience abroad. And I need to learn how other cultures and other people work. I spent some time in the US. And I got connected with this incredible organization called Kiva that hopefully some of you guys know is a peer-to-peer -peer le peer -peer lending platform. Uh, that uh, crowdfunds loans for micro-entrepreneurs around the world. And uh, I really, really wanted to get involved, so I, I applied to their fellowship program, got in, and went to Kenya. And once again, I saw another need. They were, like, they were getting less in entrepreneurs than ever. And it was because usually they were identifying entrepreneurs through microfinance institutions. But there's so many other ways you can identify entrepreneurs. Um, so I said, why don't we identify entrepreneurs through leaders, community leaders? He said, cool, let's give it a go. And in Kenya, a country I had never been to, where I did not speak Swahili, and where I did not have a lot of networks, I got the chance to onboard more than 20 trustees, community leaders referring other entrepreneurs to get this amazing opportunity of a loan to start their businesses. And that gave me, that opened an, another door. And uh, it was, uh, I got an email from a, a nonprofit in Colombia that wanted to start a local crowdfunding platform. And uh, I'm Colombian, so I was like, yes, it's a great, great time to go back to my roots. I haven't been there in forever. And I said, okay. And uh, I took on the challenge to start a crowdfunding platform in a, company, in a country that is heavily regulated, uh, especially on online transactions. And um, I was also given the challenge uh, to make it sustainable. So uh, I created this very cool uh, new product, which was white label channels for crowdfunding so companies and nonprofits could raise money to benefit whatever entrepreneurs they were targeting. That was successful. I got uh, partners like the UNDP, the biggest brewery in Colombia called Bavaria, and we funded a lot of micro-entrepreneurs in the country. Finally, <laughs> in Panama, uh, sorry, in Colombia, I said, okay, I'm ready to go back to Panama, and I'm ready to start my own thing. Come back to Panama, and uh, I thought I was ready to be an entrepreneur, so I attended this entrepreneurship conference to meet other entrepreneurs in Panama. And uh, I meet this guy in the picture. His name is Rafi. And we had to be vulnerable and share each other's stories and what were our biggest challenges as entrepreneurs. So I let him go first, and he says, well, I'm the founder of Selena, and Selena is about to grow to 100 locations all over Latin America, and my biggest challenge is to find the right people and create the right culture. I was trying to start a consulting firm on human-centered design, so I was like, ding, 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 my first client, yes. And I'm like, Rafi, I can help you with that. He's like, great, send me a proposal. Send him a proposal, and next thing I know, I'm in the Selena offices, when there was a team of four people Two hostels opened, only in Panama. And they started introducing me as the new head of HR. <laughs> and I was like, what? OK, play along is your first day. And um, then I started getting contract requisitions, and I started getting job descriptions, and I need to look for this person. And I'm like, OK. Um, entrepreneurship life gone wrong. And I'm like, I'm sorry, this was supposed to be a consultancy. I don't want to be an employee. And he's like, oh, yes, you want. <laughs> This is a challenge. You love challenges. I'm going to give you all the flexibility in the world to do your own thing, but be part of this company. 
I was already sold into the culture and the vision, and I said, sure, why not? So Selena has become the fastest growing startup in Latin America. It's a hybrid between a hostel, a hotel, a co-working space, where there's a lot, a lot of content and that is very geared towards digital nomads. So we say we're building a hospitality product for the new generation of hospitality, well, sorry, for the new generation of travelers. And in only one year and a half, we went from one country, two locations, 30 staff, to seven countries, 19 locations, and more than 800 people. And just like Rafi said, he did give me a lot of space to grow and a lot of space to create. I was the first woman, the only Latina, and the youngest in the executive board. And, uh, I got the chance to pretty much do my own thing. I created the HR department. And I created the culture Selena has uh, today, well, co-created. I had an amazing team. And uh, also, we were facing a lot of challenges. We were growing so rapidly. And I had to recruit around 100 people a day, uh, sorry, a month in the most remote places in Latin America. So I started creating different things. The first one was Selena's Got Talent. Which imagine is like American Idol meets Shark Tank. Uh, so in 24 hours, we would go into the places we were opening. We would make a call for people that wanted to work with us, and we would interview them in two minutes, then give them practical test, uh, test and then select the opening stuff in less than 24 hours. I also wanted to apply uh, my passion and mission in life, which is, of course, to leave a positive impact in this world. So I created the impact programs, uh, which is called Selena Gives Back. And uh, this is because from the beginning, we want to make sure the local community supported us. So we made sure that we started programs that were positively impacting the community and involving our three communities, our staff, our guests, and the local community. And last, we also realized that because we were hiring so many people that not necessarily had hospitality experience, or even if they did, Selena is such a different product that you needed a specific type of training. So we created the Selena Hospitality Academy, which is like a training school. And we say we're training the new generation of hospitality staff. So. That's my entrepreneurial life. And I am extremely thankful, of course, to all the mentors and bosses and people and teams I've had throughout those 10 years. But even though I loved my job, and on social media, a lot of th people think I had the best job in the world. I was traveling. I was meeting people like yourselves. Uh, I was hiring and meeting and feeling like I was giving a lot of people a lot of opportunities. I didn't feel fulfilled. And it wasn't until last year, I took a trip to Israel, and we were doing this storytelling class, and we had to go up front, like I am today. <laughs> and uh, they sent us out to a market, said, buy an object, come back and tell a story. So I went to the market, went shopping, really, then bought this ro Russian doll, that I was going to tell the story of that one time I studied abroad in Prague. Then we all come back, people start going to the front, and they start being real vulnerable. And I'm like, huh, should, should I be vulnerable? Uh, and I realized that I hadn't been vulnerable in a long, long time, because I had always assumed these crazy, amazing roles that were shaping me into someone very professional, but at the same time, in a way, getting me very distant to who I was. So. I go on stage and I said, whatever, I'm going to improvise. And I see everybody, like I'm facing you guys right now, got really, really nervous. And I said, OK, I'm going to start opening this Russian doll. And it's like I'm peeling off layers to getting to the core of me. I want to find myself again. And I started going through the layers and while crying, making people cry. But the point is, I realized, again, 
that because I was exposed to all of this knowledge and all of these lessons and all these incredible positions throughout my life, I was forgetting who I really was. And I had built a lot of layers of, you know, you have to be strong and you can't cry. And you, you can't cry when you let go of people. Everybody's looking up to you. And so that's when I said, okay, I think it's the right time to start my own thing and pursue my passions. I came back to Panama and I told my dear friend, my boss, I love you, I love Selena, but I need to go. And I need to go to pursue what really moves me. And um, this is, I don't know, how many of you guys have quit a job you were really, that you really, really liked? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really difficult because you can't explain why you're leaving. <laughs> uh, but I had a plan, and this is the important part. And uh, for those of you that haven't, and maybe, hopefully will after this talk or after the summit, uh, have a plan because it makes it go, it makes it so much easier. So I said, I know you probably think I'm irreplaceable. <laughs> By the way, everybody's replaceable. And, uh, but I'm, I promise you, I won't leave until I have a perfect transition plan. And this transition is gonna be the smoothest transition ever, ever, ever in the story of Selena. And um, he said, yeah, 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 okay. Then, uh, I was like, when I quit, I had no plan B. I was like, all I knew was that I wanted to be a digital nomad. Because all this time, we were building this product for digital nomads, but none of us were. So I said, ooh, I want to be the first that's going to walk the talk. I'm going to be a digital nomad. So I started searching, and I'm like, OK, but I need to make a living. So I knew exactly, like, I want to live here and here and here. But I was like, OK, how am I going to make money? So I started going on these sites that you guys all probably use to find jobs that I could do remotely. What I found was that actually there were not that many options for me. Huh. I only found one. <laughs> and it was to translate a CV into Spanish for five bucks. OK, I can do that. And uh, I spent 15 minutes applying for this job and uh, explaining why I was a native speaker and why I was great at translating CVs, because I had just spent two years seeing CVs every single day. And then a week later, I got this email saying, sorry, you weren't selected. And I was like, what? Who the hell am I competing with? <laughs> and, um, you know, so I said, oh my gosh, that was like a big shock, because I couldn't understand. I was like, does that mean I can't be a digital nomad? That does, does that mean that I need to learn extra skills to be a digital nomad? I said, no way. I think everybody should be a digital nomad. It should be a lifestyle that we could all be able to do. So I listed all the lessons and all the skills that I had that I got from being an entrepreneur and from life, life in general. Here are some. And uh, I said, OK, I'm pretty sure I can do any of this remotely, and instead, I saw a need, and I came up with this great idea called Gig Nomads. And I said, fine, if there's no platform that provides remote work for people that don't have any technical skills, I'm going to create it. And I came up with the idea of Gig Nomads, which is going to be a platform that's going to connect travelers around the world with very simple gigs that anyone can do anywhere in the world. So I was super happy. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, ready. And then three months went by, and I didn't do absolutely anything. And um, as you guys can probably assume, after seeing pretty much my career, I'm a doer. <laughs> so this was very, very weird. And um, I, came, I, I traveled. I went to Bali. I had a great time. I went on Nomad Cruise. Great. But I came back. And I was like, shit, I still haven't done anything. Like, people are going to ask, what the hell did you do? And what am I going to suppose, like, what am I going to say? I rested. And um, so I said, okay, why the hell didn't I do anything? And I realized was that I 
like I was terrified of being an, an, an entrepreneur and the stability and uncertainty that comes along with it. And um, so I identify my hurdles, right? What were those obstacles that were scaring me to take that leap and just start Geek Nomads? And um, instead, I did a proactive reaction that I call a kickoff. And I said, okay, what can I do very, very easily within the next 24 hours to get rid of that fear, to get rid of that hurdle? And I came up with this formula that I want to share with you guys today because it was pretty effective to me, which is pretty much observe, uh, sorry, evaluate what are the hurdles that are stopping you. And again, this can be from becoming an entrepreneur, from growing your business, from going to live to Porto, I don't know, whatever it is. I think it can, it can apply for change in general. Uh, so evaluate what are those hurdles. Observe what feeling is creating in you. Is it fear? Is it self-doubt? Is it loneliness? And flip it around. Say, okay, what proactive reactions can I have? Turn it into like very detailed actions that you can take within 24 hours. So I'm gonna walk you through my process. Hurdle number one. I felt I was swimming against the current. Uh, believe it or not, in Panama, there's very few digital nomads. <laughs> and uh, from my group of friends, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still the only single one. <laughs> the rest are married and they're stable and they're saving, but they're saving to buy a house, to have children, and here I am saying, I'm quitting my awesome job and I'm about to go spend all my savings into traveling the world and starting a company. So I got off that hurdle because I said, okay, what is, you know, why do I feel unstable? I said, because I no longer have a stable income. So I said, well, I need to leave out the front door from Selena and leave it open. And this works with any other company or any networking, any contact in general. Just make sure you always walk out the front door and you leave it open because if you have to go back and knock on it, you just enter right through. And um, that's what I did. I did an incredible transition like I promised Rafi I would do. I found my best replacement ever. And uh, I know that if I knock on that door, I can go back. But that's like my plan why? <laughs> and, and then I also reached out to other fish that were swimming against the current, maybe not in Panama, but people I looked up to and people that were entrepreneurs. And I said, I'm doing this, what do you think? And everybody was like, yeah, you're the right person to do it. Uh, and I got that encouragement. Hurdle number two, keep quiet. So I was very worried. I was like, if I tell people my idea, they're going to steal it. And uh, instead, I said, no. If I tell people my idea, I'm going to get feedback. I'm going to be able to create a product that is way more user-centered. So instead, I've been oversharing since I started. Uh, I, I'm doing a 30-day challenge, and I'm pretty much talking about my life living and working remotely in Spanish to really, really influence people to do it themselves. Hurdle number three, I should have been raising money two years ago, right? Because now I'm using my savings. And then I said, eh, actually nowadays there's so many tools. I loved Leanne's talk last year because I took a lot of her hacks into bootstrapping gig nomads. And so far we've spent $247. And uh, we have a logo, an image, a landing page, which you can sign up on. And uh, we've done incredible things with $247. And, and these are two, for example, of the tools that I've been using that I want to recommend, which is Taylor Brands. That's how I created the logo and all the image of Gig Nomads, $65 for a whole year. And uh, Ambition, which is what we're using to create the mock-ups for the MVP. Hurdle number four, you have to team, be a team of one. That really freaked me out, because again, I'm not a developer or a marketer or a designer, so I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm gonna have to learn coding. Might as well then just apply for these jobs that exist. Uh, but instead, 
I did partner mapping, and I'm super happy because one of my partners is here, Mr. Piña. Oh, I started. <laughs> yeah, also Panamanian, and he's actually the first person that started talking about digital nomadism in Panama. And uh, I said, he, like him and Nanda and Juanqui have all the skills that I don't have, and they bought into my idea in a 15-minute call, and now I'm super proud and honored to call them my partners. And the last hurdle was that I thought I needed a home base and a, an office. I mean, how was I gonna set up the printer? So instead, I said, no, I'm creating a platform that is for travelers so they can work anywhere in the world. I need to walk the talk. So now we've created a team that is 100% remotely. Nanda is backpacking South America. Piña and I are here for a month. And Juanqui is in Panama, but hopefully he'll leave soon. And um, we are really just traveling, walking the talk, trying to un understand our audience. So by the way, I took that decision four weeks ago. And we've already accomplished all of that, so we're really getting shit done now. That's for all the three months I didn't do anything. We have a name, we have a logo, we have an image, we have the core team, we have landing page and sign up page. We've done one focus group, we're gonna do more here, and I've done two speaking engagements. And we still have a long way to go, and I'm showing you this, guys, because I want you to keep us accountable because I still don't know exactly what I'm doing and I'm still scared but I know that with your support we can really make this shit happen so <laughs> within the next two months we're gonna hopefully sign up more than 500 gig nomads with no promotion whatsoever we already have 76 people signed up uh, we're gonna find five giggers that are gonna be posting gigs. We're gonna do more than 10 focus groups and we're gonna build an MVP. We're really trying to focus on focus groups because we want to make at least mistakes as possible and do an MMP for those that were here next, last year. So my key takeaways, and I think uh, you guys tell me if there's more, but uh, the first thing is that I realized that as an entrepreneur and as an entrepreneur, the best ideas come when you identify the need first. So if you're still waiting for that idea, try to look at your surroundings and say, what are my needs? What are the needs in my space? Number two, you should try to be an entrepreneur in every single job, and if they don't let you, then move on. But I got the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, you saw, in pretty much a lot of different industries and it was all thanks to the relationships I have with my supervisors. Three, always leave the door open. And this works for everything. Even if you don't go back to that job, people are natural, natural connectors. And they'll support you no matter what you do and connect you to people that you'll never know you would meet. Number four, most hurdles are self-imposed. So after I did my list of hurdles, I realized that those were things that were in my head that I had created and that I was the one that was judging myself and I was the one that was being hard on myself. Not Sometimes we ignore it and we ignore it for way too long. So make sure you become more aware and more conscious of your journey and of those si signals that are telling you you're about to take the leap. And last, well, take the leap. Uh, start something new, start something, grow something, but just trust yourself. So the last piece of advice, and this is something that really, really got me to start Gig Nomads, was the, my former boss in Selena. He said, Virginia, I have no doubt you're more than capable to do whatever the hell you want to do. But remember that at the end of the day, people will not buy into your idea, they buy into you as a person. And if you're not persistent, and you're not 100% convinced that this is what you want to do, then just don't do it. And I said, fuck no. <laughs> I am 100% convinced that this is my next step and that I'm meant to be an entrepreneur and this is what I want to do. And I got on the call, I mean on the phone, I called Pina, I called some mentors, and since then, which was December 15th, nothing but doors have opened up. 
So you guys, what is that fruit that is on your tree that you haven't been able to take a bite from? And take it. Thank you. And last, 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 before we take questions. <laughs> Uh, this is how to stay in touch, but I really want to give a huge thanks to Johnny and Stephanie and Kara and all the volunteers and Luke for doing an, uh, an incredible job at emceeing and uh, everybody that's putting up this event. It's incredible that we can all, you know, travel the world and be here. And uh, we need more digital nomads. I have no doubt with that with gig nomads and more ideas coming from you guys. Ne next year, this conference is going to be triple the size because. Digital nomadism should be a lifestyle. Thank you. So who has a question? Any questions? Ah. Bye. <laughs> Hello, great presentation. Thank you. Um, do you have any plans for dealing with the working laws in many countries? Because from living in Chiang Mai and in Thailand for two years as a digital nomad, the working laws get very complicated. So just wondering what yeah. you had in plan for that. Oh my gosh, I think one of the biggest thing I've learned about being in HR is always have a really good lawyer and a real good accountant, and then after that, a doctor. But yes. So one of the other people that I didn't put on the slide but is going to help be helping is another Latino, Colombian. He was a corporate lawyer in Colombia. He quit his job and he's been traveling the world for three years and uh, doing, uh, I mean, just living life and having a great time. And he, he's also in, in uh, Gig Nomads. He's going to be evaluating all the legal uh, exposures and liabilities that we might have. But the most important thing, and this I did learn from being in HR for two years, was uh, is gigs. So gigs right now, the gig economy is rarely regulated. And that is why the, the giggers, which are in this case going to be the companies posting gigs, cannot post anything longer than a week because it's so short term that you cannot justify there's a relationship. Therefore, there's no contract and things are a little gray. And uh, so like cool startups that have made it big in the world, we're playing on a gray space. And that is definitely something that we're getting a lot of uh, information on, but it is a gray space. And I think that's one of the disruptive things about being a digital nomad. Any more questions? Yeah. Hey, um, I really appreciated your presentation also. I love the energy. Um, I, ha I want you to explain a little bit more about this gig nomads and how is it different from Upwork or from yeah. Fiverr or whatever. Super quick because I think like Pina and I are in Chiang Mai for a month and we're going to be working out upon space. So for all of you that are around, you're probably here that we're going to do focus groups and talks and stuff. Because again, what we're trying to do is talk to you guys that so we build something cool. Um, but the main, main differences that we're doing is that uh, here, the gig nomad has the power. So I had to compete to, with I don't know how many people to get a $5 gig. Uh, here is first come, first serve. So pretty much at the beginning with the MVP, you're going to write where you are, and you're going to get a list of gigs that you can do in the place where you are. First come, first person that claims it gets it. Because again, there are gigs that are so simple that anybody can do regardless of your age, regardless of your academic background. So the gigger is not really going to have to do a selection process. And for them, in the way, the gigs that they should be posting should be gigs, again, very simple, and it, that they want a lot of people of different demographics to do to get better information. That's the main difference. And we're going to use crypto as a form of payment. OK, <laughs> last question or no? There. Okay. So thank you very oh. much, Virginia. Thank you, guys. Everyone, give a round of applause. Thanks, Virginia.